Welcome to Maple Online today. I hope you're doing well where you are, and I want to welcome you by telling you welcome home. Welcome to our home this morning. I encourage you to continue to follow us online, continue to follow us on our Maple Springs page, uh, or you can follow us on YouTube, and that's Maple Springs Seagrove if you want to go that route. I do encourage you uh, to make sure you subscribe to those pages, uh, especially our YouTube page as we continue to uh, to push for that 100 mark so we can have other opportunities uh, to be able to, to share God's Word uh, th- really throughout the world, and I encourage you to help with that. Whether you, uh, please make sure that you subscribe, but also make sure you, that you share uh, this page with other people. Uh, share this time with other people. Whether it's our Maple Minute, whether it's our services on Sunday, our youth services, our our kids zone. Make sure you share each one of those. Uh, with that said, I just want to open this up. I want us to slow down just a moment this morning and just. Open up with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for who you are and what you've done for us, dear Lord. And Father, we ask that you just be with us as we enter this time of worship today, Father. Father, wherever we are today, uh, Father, I, we know that you are present, Father, and we thank you for that. And Father, I just ask that you just lead us and guide us no matter where we are this morning, how far apart we are this morning, dear Lord. Father, I just ask that you just lead us and guide us. Lead and guide this time of worship like only you can. Move like only you can. We thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning, Maple Springs, and welcome back to our online worship service. I want to read some scripture this morning just to encourage you. Psalm 95 says, Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and praise him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Sing with us this morning. There is an endless song that goes in.
Hey, you know, everybody likes to win, and, and that's one of the, the key things in life, I think, uh, that everybody can generally grab hold of. Um, even if you're not uh, big into sports or whatever, we like to win the games we play. Um, you know, as, even as little kids, when you played Shoots and Ladders or Candyland or Sorry or whatever, you wanted to win those games. And then as you got older and you started getting into, maybe you got into some Little League and maybe you played some baseball or some football, soccer, uh, maybe you played high school sports, maybe you even got into uh, uh, college sports. You always wanted to win, um, and not everybody can win, and winning isn't the definition of, of, of life. That's not what we're trying to always uh, worry about is winning, but uh, winning is, is better than losing. Everybody can admit to that. I think the other issue <clears throat> that when we talk about it, and it doesn't even mean matter if you were on a team or you were just having fun. Uh, I think back of days um, gone by when, uh, our, our family would sit around and play games. We always wanted to win. Of course, winning's even better, though, when you're on a team. And uh, when you're with a group of people, whether it's a formal team where you're wearing uniforms or you're just having a good time, whether you're, uh, you know, maybe you're on a bowling league or you play uh, uh, a recreational soccer or something along those lines, it's always fun to win. I don't think anybody, and, and I know some people say, live by the mantra, it's not about winning or losing, it's about how you play the game, and I believe playing the game is important, uh, playing it correctly, but the truth of the matter is we always like to win, and, and the reason we like to win is winning as a unit, winning as a team is so much better, uh, even than winning on your own. Now, uh, winning that individual medal is cool, but uh, winning as a group is even better. Why? Because there are more people to uh, to revel in your glory. And that's the term we want to talk about today. Um, we're in a series called Community where we're talking about uh, how the church is unified, especially in these days when we feel like we're so spread out, so separated. We want to build that community of God's followers, the community that Jesus died for, the church. And we do that through, in week one we talked about prayer last week. This week we're going to talk about glory. And it's that glory that we get um, that that is so important. It's the whole idea that uh, uh, we can come together. In fact, let me start off by saying this. Focusing on God's glory brings us together with God and others. That may be more important than anything else we understand. It's just like when you win as a, as a team, your team comes together and you have all those celebrations. In fact, even this, sometimes it's not just teams. Sometimes it's units that you go and do something. I remember when I was uh, in high school, between my 10th and 11th grade year, we took a mission trip down to Central America, and the unity of the people that went on the trip was great. Um, there was a lot of diversity in that group. There were people that I hadn't really hung out with before a whole lot, and when we went on that trip, we got unified because we were working together for God's glory, and it was a good time. Focusing on God's glory brings us together with God and with others, which leads us into our passage. Jesus is teaching the, us these principles of unity from his last prayer before he would uh, be offered on the cross as our sacrifice for our sins and then rise again three days later uh, on that very first Easter morning. John chapter 17 is the very last prayer before they head to the Garden of Gethsemane, and it is the complete prayer of Jesus, uh, his high priestly prayer, that he's praying for his followers. And he prays some very important truths that the church, I believe, has ignored for a long time because we've been focusing on two of the three legs uh, that we talked about last week, two of the three legs of our um, tripod. We focus so much on the Great Commission and the Great Command that we forget that God wants us to uh, be unified, the great collaboration, be unified. And so he prays this prayer of unity, and we're, we're going to look at what we looked at last week, John chapter 17, verse number 1, if you have your Bibles. 17, 1, just want to start off by this verse, and we're going to go through several verses as I, as I uh, hit this issue of unity through the glory. Um, John chapter 17, verse 1, if you have your Bibles, it says, Father, the hour has come, and here's, here's where we, that's what we talked about last week, 
uh, this week it's glorify, this is his prayer, glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. The word glory is used uh, no, no less than eight times in this prayer. And it's, it's one of those words you may not use a lot in your day-to-day language, but it's a word that can be very confusing since it's used in very various ways. He uses it at times to talk about himself being glorified. He talks about glorifying God. He talks about the glory that he's receiving from his followers. He's talking about sharing his glory. Things can be confusing. But understand this. I want to get to a common level here. We talk about this so we understand how this matters to me, how this matters to you as Christ followers. The idea here, the basic word in Hebrew for glory, um, gives us the idea of, of weightiness, heaviness. In fact, uh, it's something that has glory, uh, something that has glory has such significance, such power, such transcendence that we would say it's heavy with importance. Um, I remember years ago, and I don't think people still say it, but uh, the slang term was, man, that's heavy, that's heavy. And that's sort of the idea behind what we're talking about today, because that's the word glory as you find it here in John chapter 17. Jesus uses that term right off the bat, and he says, glorify, make your son of heavy importance so I can turn around and make you of heavy importance. You see, in our day-to-day lives, we understand this somewhat, but uh, let me just say this, glory, that heaviness of, of importance, glory is defined by who God is since God is by far the weightiest reality of life. Now, you may disagree with that. If you're not a Christ follower, you may disagree with that. But in the ultimate reality, if we look at it in the truth, Jesus here, he's saying, hey, you know what? The heaviest importance in life is not my job. It's not my family. It's not all these relational matters. It's the glory of God. The heaviest thing in reality is God. Now, in human terms, we understand this because we measure gold by the ounce, same with silver by the ounce. We measure Diamonds are, are the most precious of gemstones. Diamonds by the carat, which all have to do with weight. The heavier the weight, the more valuable the substance. Of course, purity and things like that play into it too. But understand this. What I'm saying today and what Jesus is trying to get us to understand is, by using this term glory here is God is heavy with glory. God is heavy with glory. He goes, glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Uh, To glorify God, then, would be to recognize, to revere, to revel in, and proclaim the essential nature of godness, of his godness. Uh, And that's the whole idea. See, we as Christ followers, we're supposed to, according to what Jesus is saying here, we're supposed to announce Jesus' worth or God's worth, his beauty, his value, his power, his wisdom, his compassion, and his exclusivity, that's a tough word to say, to ourselves and to all others. We are to glorify God. That is, we are to promote how heavy God is. If we were to take the substances that I talked about, silver, gold, diamonds, um, the things that we value here on earth, and we were to put them on one side of the scale and then put God on the other side, the, the scale would tip desperately in God's favor because God has more glory. He is heavy. He is weighty. And so Jesus is pointing this out. And so when we use the term we're supposed to give God glory, to give glory means that it, 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 to, to bring admirable attention to. So what Jesus is proclaiming as we're looking in this issue of unity in the church, he's saying, hey, if you want to do what we're supposed to do, if we're trying to build this togetherness that we talked about uh, in the very first statement I made, focusing on God's glory brings us together with God and others. If we're going to do this, then we have to glorify God. That means we're bringing admirable attention to God. Now, once again, we find a difference here between the 21st century Christians, 21st century church, and the 1st century church. Because they understand that, that, that mark of glory better than we do. See, today, we don't bring admirable attention to God. So often we find pastors in the headlines, not because they're bringing glory to God, but because they're being arrested for stupidity, or they're being arrested for sinful acts. And I don't think God expects everybody to be perfect. Don't don't get me there. But what I do think is God says, hey, I'm giving you glory so you can glorify me. And that's what Jesus is saying. Think about this. Jesus, as he performs every one of the miracles throughout his his many days uh, of, of ministry for three and a half years, 
Jesus never one time stops and says, hey, look at this miracle I can do. This is pretty cool. You want to see some power? Let me show you some power. No, everything Jesus does in this revelation of himself was what he says here in John 17, 1. Glorify me so that I can glorify you. What he did was he used his miraculous powers not to wow the crowds, not to impress people, not to get attention, not even to gain influence. Because most of the time, if you remember, Jesus heals somebody and says, hey, go and don't say anything. Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody who did this. Jesus really was saying, hey, you know what? I want you to give God glory, not me. Because when you give God glory, we're united in glory. That's the whole idea there. See, glory is central to living together with God and bringing people together for God. And the reason we as a church, we haven't done such a great job is we haven't given God the glory. Which brings us to this idea of glory grabbers. This is a problem in today's society. It probably is a problem. Uh, I can go through the Bible and I can point out various times there were people that did this. But it's very prominent in the 21st century. Glory grabbers. These are the people who want the attention. Uh, they're the ones who, uh, they want admiration given to themselves. They're the ones that, when they're in a, a worship service, they want themselves to be pointed out. They want to sing a little bit louder, even if it's off key. They want to sing a little bit louder than everybody else so that everybody looks at them. They want to make sure that every bit of attention is given to them in Bible studies. They want to act a little crazy and, and do things to get wow, and they will do it um, even in nice ways. They'll tell you, hey, I love you, and, and they, but they're seeking you to say, hey, you're the greatest, you're the smartest, you're the, the wise. And they don't have a problem with honoring God as long as somewhere along that line of honoring God, they get a little credit for themselves too. Glory grabbers. Glory grabbers, though, the problem is, is they're not only hurting themselves, which is a personal issue, but they're also hindering the oneness of the church, and they're slowing the church's advance. Because the world sits back and says, hey, I know why you're doing that. Hey, I see the shows that you're putting on. We want to be entertained. We'll go to somewhere that's, that's built for entertainment. People don't come, for the, come to the church, and I think we've forgotten this in the 21st century. People aren't coming to church to be entertained. If they are, they're, they're, they're at the wrong place. You can get far better entertainment with Disney and, and other places that are built for entertainment. Go down to the movie theater if you want good entertainment. What we are supposed to be doing is helping people on their journey. Remember our mission? We're helping people at the very stages of their life on their journey towards Christ, with Christ, get closer to him. And that's the whole idea there. See, Jesus was the opposite of the glory grabbers. His one purpose, as we, we already saw there in, in John 17, 1, is stated in that opening request. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. But if we don't look at the very first statement that preceded it, then we will miss really what's going on here. He says, Father, the hour has come, which leads us to that question. And we probably know the answer, but it, it, the question is, what hour? What purpose will you come for? What is the, the whole work? And really the whole work here, this hour Jesus is speaking of, is the hour that was proceeding to, that Jesus would be, would be crucified. The shadow of the cross was looming heavy on Jesus' shoulders now as it's getting late into the night as Judas is preparing to betray Jesus. And the hour has come and Jesus realizes his purpose is to glorify his Father at the price of his own life. That's the whole idea. In fact, if you look in, in verses 4 and 5, John 17, 4 and 5 is the next uh, session we see. He says, I have brought you glory. Speaking to God the Father once again, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. What work? Well, it was the work of drawing people and glorifying. It really is the work of glorifying God. See, everything has a purpose. And God's not an egomaniac, but Everything in life is built and is designed for the glory of God. Even our existence, even the existence of evil people and evil circumstances is built upon the glory of God. Something goes wrong in your life. I know several of you are grieving because you've lost loved ones. Do you realize that loss was for the glory of God? I don't understand all those things. You say, well, I had a friend of mine die. I had a child die. I had a grandparent die. I had such and such, you know, this person had this happen. You can talk about things like cancer and diseases, maybe miscarriages, maybe other problems in life. But I want you to know what Jesus is saying. Everything was built on the fact that this hour, this hour of total glorification. See, the hour that he's speaking of is the glorification of God to the fullest, where Jesus, who is not being glorified fully, 
He's going to enter into that circumstance where he's separated from God. He's going to overcome sin. He's going to overcome death. And he will be glorified once again in the presence of God the Father, the ultimate glory. And he says, he goes on, verse 5, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. That's the whole idea. He, he goes on to think this thing through. So what we're saying here is his life <clears throat> was lived for the work the Father gave him to do. That's how he lived his life. In fact, you go back to, think about this. He's 12 years old. He's been separated uh, with, from his parents, and he's in the temple, and his parents have been gone three days. And that, I, it makes you wonder about the parenting thing here, but anyway, that's a whole other message. But they didn't miss him for three days. Either that he was that good of a kid, and I believe he was that good of a kid. But they didn't miss him for three days. So they find him, he's in the temple, and he's teaching. He's doing something extraordinary, and when they, they, you know, they sort of scold him for being absent from them, what does he say? He says, hey, I'm here doing my father's will. I'm doing my father's work. I must be about my father's business. What he's saying is, my business is to glorify God, and so here I am at the age of 12, I'm glorifying God. I'm glorifying God in the works that I'm doing. I'm glorifying God, and every step of the way was him glorifying God. Every hour had been for the glory of God, and, and he did his assigned work to the admiration of the Father. Think about this. As, the, as John the Baptist baptizes Jesus, what happens is you hear this voice that says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In fact, several times it tells us to do that, and then it says, Listen to him. Listen to him. This is my beloved Son, because he knew the purpose, and realized this, he was looking forward to seeing Jesus was following the, the, the practice of glorifying God. In verse number 10, in the second half of verse number 10, Jesus says this, and glory has come to me through them. He's talking about his disciples. He's really talking about us, but he's talking about his disciples too. And he says, glory has come to me through them. So what we're, we get out of that is we get the expectation that we are built to glorify God just as Jesus was glorifying God. And the problem is, is that sometimes we become glory grabbers, as I already said. And glory grabbing for ourselves diminishes the unity with God and others. See, I see a lot of churches, in fact, it doesn't take much to look back over the last 20, 30 years and look at the famous headlines of, of major denominational, major church leaders. And how they've fallen from grace for either stealing money, embezzling, having affairs, doing evil practices. I was thinking about down in Florida, there was a gentleman who, he had, been, he had been taking money, he had been questioned in the newspaper, he had been taking money to pay for his daughter's wedding, which was an extravagant uh, wedding, stealing there, nobody questioned him that. And on top of it, he had his deacons, he had his pastoral staff and his deacons agree to pay off, and this is what really blew it all wide open, to pay off his mistress. I think it was $20,000 or so. He took church's money and had them pay off the mistress, who she eventually felt scorned anyway, and went to the newspaper for the story. And, and you say, why are you telling me that? Because what happened is a church that was once one of the major vibrant churches in the Orlando area is now a church that is talked about in regards to the actions of its pastor because he grabbed the glory of God for himself. We've got to be careful. You look at uh, a, lot of the a lot of the struggles in major uh, speakers, major uh, authors, Christian authors that we all love to read and we love to hear. You know what they're squabbling about today? They're not squabbling over a doctrine. They're squabbling over who's in charge, who's more prominent. Should a woman be in charge or should a man be in charge? And you know what I'm sitting back going? They need to read John 17 because Jesus says, don't give the glory for yourself, give the glory to God. And the reason the world's sitting back shaking their heads is because the world says, I don't want to be a part of something that you guys can't even agree with each other. You guys can't even get along. So let's stop being glory grabbers. So is this our determination? Are we seeking what Jesus wanted? Jesus says, hey, you know what? I'm here to glorify my Father in everything I do. Is that your determination in how you live your life? <laughs> is 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 your passion to bring attention, uh, affection, and admiration to the Father? That's what Jesus wanted. That was his sole purpose in everything he did. And that manifested itself in the cross. We keep going down through John 17. We find the next instance there in John chapter 17, verse number 22. Jesus 
uh, he gives us an gr even greater mystery than what we've been talking about in some of these aspects, and hopefully we're clearing up the aspect of sharing and the glory as it unifies us. He says this, I have given them the glory that you gave me. <laughs> That's shared glory. That's crazy. And, and, and think about what he's saying there. He's saying, God, I'm giving, you, I'm giving them, the disciples, the followers, the Maple Springs disciples, those Christians down there in Seagrove, I'm giving them some of the glory that I have as one of the Trinity, as one of the members of the Godhead. Why? And he tells it very clearly that they may be one as we are one. Unity. See, the glory shared among the Godhead is shared with us. And that just blows my mind. And you may have never even thought about that, but that's the truth. This glory is given, though, for one reason, one reason only, and that's what John 17, 22 clears for us. It isn't giving us glory so that we can go out and do something crazy. It's given us glory so that we can be one, unified, and one in our mission, one in our ministry, one in what we do. And it's really a reflection of what we're supposed to do. You see, the unity Jesus is imparting here is a distinct brand of oneness. It's not produced through philosophical alignments. Well, I, I agree with the philosophy or not. That, that has nothing to do with this. This is produced by the Spirit of God. It's not produced through emotional harmony. Well, I just feel this tingly thing when I go to church. That's not what it's all about. It's not a, hey, you know what? And, and I want to make sure we're clear on this one. It's not produced through political agreements. I think that's one of the downfalls today, and you've heard me say this over and over again, and I'm not trying to make anybody upset, but the church is not a political institution. Governments will come and go, and I am as patriotic as anybody here. My dad taught me that, and that's the truth. But you know what? God's kingdom is not the United States of America. God's kingdom was started through Jesus Christ, and it's promoted, and it is a kingdom of heaven, not here on this planet. We can get into that a little later. This oneness, though, this unity that we share, this glory that we share is created by the Spirit of God in the same manner as it is experienced in the Godhead. And that blows my mind when you think about it. That's what Jesus is saying here in John 17, 22. He says, you know what? The same glory that I, you gave me, I'm giving them. And, and, and we, we miss that power. We miss that glory. We can't attain that, that unity. We can't attain that glory through our own wisdom and our own efforts, though. And so often, that's what we've decided we would do. Let's just work harder. Let's just have better, better this and better that. And you know what? It better is not bad, but better is not God's glory. And I think so often we get sidetracked, as, as uh, J uh, Jim Collins would say, we, we've, we've settled for the good when we should have been going after the great. The greatness of God. God says, I've given you glory. Why are you settling for crumbs? I've given you glory. Why are you worried about uh, how comfortable you are? I've given you glory. Why are you worried about doing anything other than glorifying me? Because that was what we're called to do. You see, we honor others. We honor, let me say it this way. We honor other believers because they too are carriers of the Spirit of God. And so we glorify Christ in them. Several years ago, I was in uh, Tanzania, Africa. I, I took a group of guys, and we went to the foothills, uh, the foot of uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. And uh, our project there was to help a community that was very poor build a, uh, they had a, a mud hut type building. We went and built them a solid building. Now, nothing like you have here in the United States, but this was a pretty nice building. But I remember the, the Sunday that we had finished the building, it was the Sunday, we're going to go in, we're going to have a dedication sermon uh, service, we're going to have uh, dinner on the grounds, and there would probably be, I think there was somewhere around seven to 800 people there that day from the village. Big event, white men in town, it was a big event because there's a new building they want to see, and we're feeding everybody. But I remember that morning, the, uh, the missionary had asked uh, if we would go and... Uh, start the morning off by having a bit of breakfast. And he, and, and he, he said, it'll be small, it won't be much, um, but a bit of breakfast with the pastor. Now, he's talking about the national pastor. The national pastor didn't live in, in uh, wealth or opulence. In fact, I remember, when we, I remember how, how humbled I was when we walked into his hut. His hut was just a dirt floor, um, small, probably 10 by 15 room. They did everything in it. 
And as we sat there and the chickens ran across our feet and, and all kinds of other animals, he had gone out that morning and sent someone to the store, um, which was very unusual. He didn't have much money. He doesn't make hardly anything because he's a bivocational pastor. He has to, to make his own money, and he doesn't get paid to be a pastor. And he went out that morning and wanted to sacrifice his money to do something for us. And so he went out that morning and, and spent his hard-earned money on a bag of rolls. Rolls, just plain rolls, nothing special about them. And he had cooked some, some chai, some tea, some hot tea. It had uh, their milk in it. And we sat there, and each one of us had a roll and some milk. And he didn't speak English. I don't speak Swahili. Yes, there was an interpreter, and so we had some interaction. But it was just quiet in that early morning. Early morning before church would even think about getting started as we sat there and we just had a roll. And I remember feeling how humbled I was. But I remember feeling connected to this man who I really didn't know, who I couldn't even speak with, who our skin colors were so different. I remember feeling so connected. And I remember feeling God's power in my life more, more keenly, more greatly as I connected with this man who I couldn't even speak the same language. Why? Because we were one. We were unified as we tried to glorify God. We were unified in the glory of God, and that's really what it's all about. We glorify other people by glorifying Christ in them. And that's how we connect, and that's how we unify our church. See, when I look out at the congregation at Maple Springs, I realize there's a lot of different personalities, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different, um, different styles. And when we all come together, it could be awkward at times, but we don't come together just for social interaction. We don't come together just for fun. We come together in the unity of God. And we share in His glory with each other. That's how we can love each other. That's how we can honor each other. And when we do that, we best glorify God. Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God speaks to the prophet Isaiah, and he says this. He says, I am the Lord. This is an amazing verse. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not yield my glory to another or my praise to idols. I will not yield my glory to another. You know what he's saying here? As we reflect back on what Jesus is saying, what we gather here is our glory is sourced only from God. We share in what belongs to God. It's not something that, hey, you know what, Maple, we can't go out and get glory from our community because it would be false glory. It wouldn't be anything. See, to take any of God's glory for ourselves becomes a treacherous act, encouraging a significant break in the church, and that's one of the problems of churches today. They've looked to have better bands. They've looked at, and there's nothing wrong with have, having excellence in your worship. There's nothing wrong with having excellence in how you communicate truth. But I want you to know so often that these major, uh, these major narcissistic leaders, no matter what side, I've seen narcissistic leaders in churches of 300, 150, 100, all the way up to churches of thousands, and they start thinking that they're God. And here's the idea. We can't be one, we can't be in unity if we're hijacking God's glory for ourselves. Because the idea behind what Isaiah is saying there gives us the idea of the moon and the sun, right? See, the, the moon shines very brightly some nights when the sky is clear, but the truth of the matter is you know this to be true. The moon doesn't really shine at all. It just reflects the sun. And that's really the glory that we're given is God's glory reflecting off of us so that it can be shined on a world all around us. <laughs> Towards the end of his prayer, Jesus makes a unique request there in verse number 24 as we finish up. Verse number 24, Jesus prays, Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am. Now, he's not talking about locationally. When he says that, Jesus is saying, I want them to be where I'm at spiritually. I want them to be where I'm at in you. I want them to be in the center of your glory. And he says, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you love me before the, found, uh, before the creation of the world. And what he is really pushing here, what he's trying to get across here, simple truth, is go back to the Mount of Transfiguration. James, Peter, and John, they probably flash this in their minds as Jesus prays this, and they realize, good grief, 
we remember that day when we saw God's glory. And Jesus, what he's doing here is he's, he's yearning for his disciples to bask in that glory, that unmasked glory of his full lordship, which only three of them had really seen a glimpse of it. What he's desiring for them is that future glory that Paul talks about in his writings. And really what he's saying here is really the desire is something even further than that. It's a desire to serve his friends with the overwhelming joy and thrilling splendor of his loving presence and absolutely having no filters. See, the filters of this evil world has kept us from seeing the glory of God too often. Have you ever seen something so incredible, so awesome, so magnificent that the first thought you had was, I wish so-and-so, I wish my wife, I wish my husband, I wish my kids, I wish my family, I wish my friends, I wish they could experience it, I wish they could see it. That's really what Jesus is saying in this prayer here. He's saying, I wish that they could see the glory of God through me and in me. I wish they could see the power. Then they wouldn't have to worry about their day-to-day life and that the fact that they might be defeated. They wouldn't have to worry about how Satan's planning to trap them. They wouldn't have to worry about a Roman Empire that's standing against them. They wouldn't have to worry about the United States government and maybe their quest. They wouldn't have to worry about a virus that may overwhelm them. What they could do is they could filter everything through God's glory, not through the sinful world around them. He says, when you get, because when we get to that point where you see God's glory, your desire won't be to consume God's glory, it'll be to share God's glory. And that's how another reason that we know the church isn't really practicing the glory of God. See, Jesus is encouraging us to get involved in that glory, and when we do, we won't want to enter into that glory unless we can bring others with us. And that's what drives our evangelism. See, we don't need another plan. We don't need another uh, witnessing tool. What we need is the glory of God to fill our lives so that we go out and share that glory. Remember what Jesus says? Jesus says, when the Son of Man is lifted up, he'll draw all men into himself. And if there's a reason why people aren't converting to Jesus, aren't becoming followers of him these days, it's because we haven't used the glory of God the way God wants it to be used. John described it over in, about this new Jerusalem over in Revelation, Revelation 21, verse 23. This is what, notice what John says here. He's talking about this glory of God. He says, the city, that is new Jerusalem, does not need the sun or the moon to shine, for the glory of God gives it light. And the lamb is its lamp. That's the glory that we have to live in. You say, that's in the future. No, we can live in God's glory. If you read through John 17, we can live in God's glory now. See, sharing in God's glory means we see his glory in one another. And that's what's great. We don't look at our our fellow church member. We don't look at our fellow Christians and look at their problems because we all have problems. We look at them and see the glory of God in their life. It's not about just filtering good things. It's about filtering the glory of God. We share the glory of God with each other because we see Jesus in each other, which leads me to the final truth. I always try and leave with one truth, and this is it. Unity is built when we live fully focused on one glory, God's. You know, maybe today you're sitting here and you've you've thought about the glory of God Maybe this wasn't exciting as some of the messages. Sometimes it's easier to teach stories and preach stories because they're just so cool and so exciting. But when you get down to the truth of the glory of God, how do we get a unified church? How do we build our church in the unity that Jesus prayed about? We have to live fully focused on the glory of God. I don't know about you. Maybe you're not a Christ follower. In this whole aspect of glory, you're sitting back going, wow, this is crazy. It's crazy until you know who Jesus is. If you don't know who really Jesus is, I would encourage you today, contact someone, contact us. I would love to, to have a conversation with you about who Jesus really is. I, I, I urge you to seek more about him. But you know the truth is, you're off the hook because most of these messages right now, that I've been, these messages about Christianity, about the church, about people who, who have given their lives to follow Jesus, But the truth of the matter is, if we think about this aspect, unity is built when we are fully focused on one glory, God's. 
I think in my own shame, I think too often I've sought other glory. I've sought my own. I've gotten distracted by seeking my favorite teams. Maybe, maybe that's where you find yourself. I've sought the glory of other things, accomplishments. I've sought the glory of the United States of America. I've sought the glory of all these different things. And you know what God says? Remember what Isaiah said? You go back to that quote in Isaiah. He says, God says, the, God, the Lord is my name, and I'm not sharing my glory with anyone. No idols get my praise. So let me ask you, what have you really sought to promote in your life? If we went and took your social media, your Facebook page, and we looked at it, what are you promoting? Are you promoting God's glory? Or are you promoting something else? Now, it's okay to have favorite teams. It's okay to have all these other things. But you know what? I learned some lessons that I was worried more about my favorite college team than I was worried about God's glory sometimes. I sat back thought about some of the pastors I worked under, and I saw them, they were worried more about the glory of their favorite team than they were the glory of God. In fact, their messages became about their teams, and I don't want to ever do that. Let's follow what Jesus prayed. I think the best days of Maple Springs Baptist Church are far ahead of themselves when we seek to, first of all, unify under prayer, and then secondly, unify by promoting the glory glory of God. So what are you going to do this week? I encourage you in this, this next couple days, instead of just talking about the weather, instead of talking about COVID-19, instead of talking about all the various other things, hey, seek to promote the glory of God through conversations that lead to God. I'm not talking about taking a hard nose, are you going to heaven or going to hell kind of stand. I'm just saying, hey, learn how to talk about the glory of God. Somebody comes to you and they say, talk to you about a, an issue in their life. Why don't you turn it around and say, hey, God may be working in this area. Let's lift God up like he desires. Let's pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, God, we give you the glory, the honor, the praise that so often we've kept for ourselves, so often we haven't given to you, so often we've put in our church buildings, we put in our praise teams, we put in our, our, our media, we put in all the different things. God, we want to give you the glory, for you're the only one who deserves it. And anything we've gotten, God, help us to filter it through our lives and understand it's just a reflection that needs to go back to you. So we pray, as a church, that you would draw us closer, help us to unify by glorifying you in our workplaces, in our places of recreation, on our social media. God, help us to stop posting memes and start turning people's attention to your glory. Help us to be about your business, just as Jesus was. We thank you for loving us, but we thank you most of all for dying for us on the cross and rising again that third day. We thank you for everything. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.
Again, welcome to Mabel Online. I'm Tracy Marsh. I'm the youth pastor here at Mabel Springs. And I do want to mention a few ministry opportunities that we actually have uh, coming up the next several weeks. Uh, as you know, with, uh, with still the stay-at-home orders and everything that's going on, and, and we want to honor our communities uh, and follow uh, that directive that's in front of us. But we also have a couple dates in front of us uh, that are coming up. First of all, we have Mother's Day coming up this week. Uh, kids, husbands, I want to make sure that you realize that, that, that they're probably still going to expect something, uh, whether it's a homemade card or whatever. I'm just putting that out there. Uh, but don't forget that that service, uh, that service is still going to be online. And also our homecoming service uh, coming up May 17th is, is, is going to be online as well. Things are just going to be different this year. But this is where your ministry opportunity is. Invite folks to the page in order to watch that. Invite them to the YouTube channel so they can watch those online, whether it's, it's family that you haven't seen in a while uh, for the homecoming service. Give them opportunity to still be a part of it, uh, whether it's still online or not. Uh, so please make sure you, you know that. And also, don't forget this week, um, this Thursday, is National Day of Prayer. This actually uh, came about back in 1952 when our government decided that we needed to make sure uh, that we call to God. Uh, and I think, you know what, this year it's no different. Uh, we, need to, we need to call to God. Uh, so this Thursday is a National Day of Prayer. I encourage you uh, to make sure that, that you set aside time that day, whether it's through fasting, whether it's through your time, you set time up throughout the day. I encourage you to do that and pray for our nation. Uh, our nation needs our prayer. And speaking of prayer, uh, this is the time that we come together and pray for one another. And I encourage you to make sure that you're doing that. Uh, pray for each other as we are. We seem like we're so far apart, but yet we're still family. We're still the church, so we need to continue to pray for one another. I do want to mention Miss Cole to you this morning. I, I do ask that you continue to pray for her, uh, continue to pray for that, that situation, and we ask that you uh, continue to pray for Randolph County uh, as we uh, are still uh, in the midst of, of this pandemic. And I just ask that you just... Just lift each other up in your prayers. Uh, and with that said, uh, let me ask you a question. Uh, have you had a difficult day this past week? Uh, was yesterday a difficult day? Was, was a week ago a difficult time? Uh, or maybe today. Uh, today are you having that difficult day? Or maybe you know that you're going to have a difficult day one day next week. Whatever the case, let me encourage you to do something. Don't rely on yourself. Uh, when we rely on self, uh, for some reason, that just causes more anxiousness in our own hearts and in our own minds. So what I encourage you to do is go to the one that offers courage and strength, uh, the one that, that we need to lean on, the one that we need to pray to. And that's a scripture that I want to share with you this morning. In Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul writes, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a promise he gives us there. Notice what Paul says, though, in every situation. What he's saying here, no matter where you find yourself, no matter where you are on life's highway, guess what? God is there. Lean on Him. Give your request to Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for today. Father, we thank You for each and every day that You give us. Father, we thank You for all that You have given us, all that You do for us. Father, You are so gracious, and we thank You so much for that. And Father, we do uh, lift up Miss Cole to You today. Uh, Father, we ask that, that you just be with her, leading God, her and the family, dear Lord, Father, as they go through this time. Father, I ask that you be with your church. Father, I ask that you be with Maple Springs. Father, I ask that you be with, with every member. Father, I ask that you be with every ear that is hearing this today. Father, I ask that you work in their lives, move in their lives in such a way that they stand back in awe and say, that's my God. 
That's our prayer today. Father, you move in such a way that the only thing that we can do is stand back in awe and say, that's my God. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. time we are going to celebrate our tithes and offerings and I'm going to encourage you to have your Bible turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7 and as you turn there I have a question for you today do you like or do you enjoy or do you love getting gifts or even giving gifts uh, I mean, think about it. Christmas, birthdays, Valentine's Day, Easter, uh, especially we just came out of Easter and, and giving an Easter basket to a kid. You know, how enjoyable is that to be able to give a gift to somebody and see their whole uh, face light up? And, or even yourself, how much uh, I know I enjoy uh, getting a gift just as much as the next person and, and how much joy comes out of doing that because you just care for somebody or that they care for you that much. Now think about this for a moment. How would you feel if someone came up to give you a gift but they had a scowl on their face? They they just had that look on their face that, that made it quite obvious that they did not want to give you the gift. But they were they were encouraged or made to give you this gift or, or how about even if they try to give you the gift and they hold on to it so tightly uh, you have to literally pry it out of their hands let me ask you a question is that truly giving 
No, absolutely not. That's ridiculous, right? A gift should come from the heart, right? Uh, and that's where we pick up in our scripture this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. It reads, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So what the Apostle Paul is, is saying here to the church in Corinth, uh, that God loves that cheerful giver. He wants you to be excited about giving. He wants you to do it from the heart. That's the way we should give our gifts to God. Because we love Him. Because we want to give to Him. Uh, and that He deserves those things because they're His anyway, right? So, so God will bless us when, you, when we give with that cheerful heart. And, and what an honor it is to be able to, to give cheerfully into the kingdom of God. Uh, so we continue uh, to give. Uh, and I encourage you to do that, whether it's through Tidely, uh, and you can find that on our Maple Springs page, uh, or you can mail them in, or you can simply drop them by still. Uh, but I encourage you to continue to give. And, and on that, uh, I do have an update on the Annie Armstrong offering. We are two weeks in. We still have two more weeks uh, to give to that. Uh, and I encourage you to continue to do that. But we are actually past the goal uh, that God put in front of us at the very beginning. Uh, uh, but the giving doesn't stop there, and I encourage you to continue to go above and beyond. Uh, and I encourage you to to to, to prayerfully consider uh, giving to Annie Armstrong and and Lottie Moon and, and and those different ministries throughout the year. This is not just a one time gift that we can give. We can continue to giving because, to be honest with you, our international mission board uh, and, and our Na uh, North America mission board. We have missionaries out there year-round, uh, so the gifts can continue to give throughout the year. So, so make sure you pray about that. And with that said, uh, let's 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 have a word of prayer as again we celebrate our tithes and offering this morning. Father, we come before you today as cheerful givers. Father, we come before you today excited to give to your kingdom. Father, we come to you today excited. Father, to see what you're going to do and to see how that you're going to move. Father, we thank you for being so generous to us and, and giving to us and blessing us, Father. And Father, in turn, Father, we give it to you. Father, we give ourselves to you, Father. That's our prayer today, Father, that, that we give our complete selves to you. Father, so that you can move in such a mighty way. Father, that's what it's about. Always, Father, may we be so excited to give to you. Father, we thank you and we love you. And we ask all this in Christ's name. Amen.